started. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, January Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium. Um, we're going to be covering treating healthy clinical trial participants and some of the um, ethical and practical issues involved. Um, my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a professor of medicine uh, here at Brigham Women's Hospital at the Portal uh, Research Center as well as at the Center for Bioethics and um, Leah Rand and myself organized this uh, consortium um, and are excited about uh, getting 2023 kicked off on uh, on a on a good note with this uh, with this really excellent topic and, and group of of uh, of of experts. Um, next slide. Uh, so just as a quick reminder of some logistics, um, please ask questions. Uh, um, you know, feel free to enter questions in the Q and A feature when, uh, along the way. Um, there'll be some time at the end that'll be dedicated to questions, um, and uh, and the Q and A function uh, button is the is the right way to do that. Um, if you have technical issues, you can put those in the chat, and we can help you. But um, if you have questions for to, for discussion or for the panelists, please put those in the Q and A. If you want to talk about these on um, uh, Twitter or uh, Mastodon or Post or um, whatever social media you're using right now. Um, we use the hashtag uh, HMS Bioethics or hashtag Policy Ethics um, as a way to follow those um, the conversation. Um, and if you have questions about um, future programming at the Center for Bioethics, feel free to check out um, the Bioethics website. Next slide. Um, the goals, um, as always, of these consortia are to try to articulate key issues in the healthcare system that involve ethically challenging policies and practices. Uh, bring together experts with different perspectives um, to consider various solutions and to try to stimulate conversation and further um, further evaluation of the topic. Um, as th that is everybody's homework. So um, we're getting set up for the rest of the year. We're going to talk about climate change in February. Um, it would have been reasonable potentially to talk about climate change today when it is 60 degrees in Boston, but instead we're going to talk about it in February. Um, talking about open access innovation for vaccines um, in March and um, discriminating devices um, and uh, racial equity in uh, in April. So um, get uh, put your put these on your calendar and more information is is available online on the bioethics website. Um, so to introduce today's topic, I want to uh, turn the floor over to um, my uh, co-organizer Leah Rand, um, who is. Um, uh, a, a colleague of mine in Portal, um, a faculty member in the division uh, in the in the Center for Bioethics, um, and uh, and and you know has a lot of expertise in um, in ethics uh, and ethical theory. So uh, Leah, um, thanks for uh, helping organize the session. Thank you, Aaron, and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, which uh, arose from a particular interest of mine, and so I'm. Delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Benjamin Silverman, who will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, Dr. Silverman is an academic psychiatrist with a background in medical ethics and addiction psychiatry. He has over 10 years of experience in analyzing ethical issues posed by scientific research, building on his clinical training in psychiatry and addiction psychiatry. He currently serves as an IRB chair at the Mass General Brigham IRB, which is responsible for oversight of human subjects research at the McLean Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Brigham and Women's Hospital, among others. Previously, he's been the chair of the McLean Hospital IRB. Um, and in these roles, he has been responsible for scientific, regulatory, and ethical review of human subject research protocols across multiple large academic institutions. And as part of this work, he routinely counsels investigators on scientific, regulatory, and ethical issues both in formal and informal presentations to help move forward, forward science in a broad way. Holly Fernandez Lynch will be uh, presenting first and she is an assistant professor of medical ethics in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She co-chairs the School of Medicine's Research Ethics and Policy Series and serves in this, as an assistant faculty director of online education initiatives in the department, where she helps lead the Master of Healthcare Innovation. She also has a secondary appointment as an assistant professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. Professor Fernandez Lynch is the co-founder and co-chair of the Consortium to Advance Effective Research Ethics Oversight, or ARIO, a collaborative effort in 
established in 2018 to understand, evaluate, and improve IRB quality and effectiveness. She served as a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Advi Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections. She is currently a member of the Boards of Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research, the Primer, the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, and the NYU Working Group on Compassionate Use and Pre-Approval Access. She also serves as the ethicist in residence at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And prior to joining Penn, Professor Fernandez Lynch was here at um, Harvard as the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health po Law, Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics, and was teaching faculty in the Masters of Bioethics program. So it's wonderful to have her back with us today. Um, she'll be followed by Jill Fisher, who is professor of social medicine and core faculty at the UNC Center for Bioethics. Dr. Fisher is a social scientist with a PhD in science and technology studies from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and expertise in medical sociology and research ethics. Dr. Fisher has published three books, which I highly recommend, and over 50 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. She is the recipient of approximately $4.9 million in funding as a principal investigator on grants from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. And in addition to her work on clinical trials, Dr. Fisher has published on the social construction of Munchausen syndrome, tattooing as a cultural practice, gender and science, hospital tracking and location technologies, non-human animal research, and qualitative methods. So I'm really excited to welcome this wonderful panel to, with, to us today. And uh, over to you, Dr. Silverman. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much to the audience for joining us today. And thanks very much to Dr. Zorand and Kesselheim for organizing, hosting, and inviting us. Uh, to this meeting and, and for this discussion on this really uh, interesting and important topic. Um, so to introduce today's session, I thought it might be helpful uh, for me to just to, to describe some basic concepts related to participant remuneration in clinical research and to discuss how IRBs traditionally uh, approach them. Um, without getting into detail, there's been a, a long and vigorous debate about paying subjects for, for clinical trial participation, uh, and remuneration to subjects is now widely accepted as a, a standard practice. We generally classify remuneration uh, as compensation for time and effort or inconvenience uh, expended by research participants during their participation. Uh, remuneration is not meant to be a, a benefit of participation and is uh, not considered as a benefit when IRBs assess the approval criteria for a study. Uh, of note, this is distinct from reimbursement or repayment for out-of-pocket expenses incurred while participating in research, for example, uh, travel or parking, uh, which we would hope would uh, always be covered to the degree uh, possible. In addition to compensation for time and effort, remuneration also serves a function of incentivizing uh, clinical trial enrollment or completion. Uh, and this is certainly a topic of, of ongoing discussion. Um, the traditional IRB or ethical concern around participant remuneration really centers on the fear or risk of paying people too much. Uh, in other words, offering a payment that causes undue influence on a potential subject and their decision to participate. Uh, so to say that another way, essentially we worry about uh, excessive payments uh, motivating someone to participate in research or take on risks that they would otherwise not take on. Um, and I think that stance from IRBs has likely kept payments lower, uh, perhaps too low uh, uh, throughout, you know, throughout the years. Uh, equally important, if not more important, uh, and actually less traditionally focused on by IRBs is the risk of paying people too little. Uh, for example, many of our studies offer really more symbolic payments and don't meet uh, what we consider a standard minimum wage. And I think this concern over whether participants are compensated fairly will really be a key question for, for today's session. Um, I'll just say that concern is amplified in phase one research, which we're focusing on today, where healthy volunteers enroll and are exposed to often unknown risks, for example, first in human studies, with no possibility for direct medical benefit. Um, because of that, and because phase one studies require significant time commitment, they, uh, they do offer, usually offer more compensation. Um, but as a result of that, when we look at then who actually enrolls in phase one studies, I think we'll talk about that today, we really must ask the question as if we're exploiting certain populations or unfairly distributing the burdens of research. 
Um, so to wrap up from the IRB perspective, uh, by, by way of introduction, I'll just note that traditionally, I think the goal of IRB oversight of research compensation is to ensure that stipends paid to research subjects are both fair and without causing undue pressure to participate. That said, IRBs tend to be very conservative, and I think most IRBs hold a concept that uh, monetary compensation is not intended to be the only motivating factor uh, to induce subjects to participate. Um, and that's certainly the case for some phase one studies, for example, enrolling non-healthy volunteers like cancer studies or in certain research communities like ALS research community. But uh, at least in my personal opinion, I think for many healthy volunteers, really the financial incentive is the primary or perhaps only reason for participation. Um, and I think in some cases, I worry that IRBs and, and researchers and others uh, essentially stand behind a description of compensation for time and effort to, to avoid feeling some discomfort about what we're actually doing, which is paying people to enroll in research or for use of their bodies for research. And I fear that in the process of kind of hiding behind that, uh, we really risk not, pay, not paying people enough to fairly compensate them. So I know we're going to talk about all of this and, and more today, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Fernandez Lynch to get us uh, going. Okay, well, thanks. I don't have to give my talk anymore because you've just, you know, established all the principles really, um, really nicely. <laughs> so hang on one moment and I'm just going to um, share my slides for everyone. And can you see those okay? I hope. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you for having me here today. I'm really looking forward to talking about these issues with everyone. Um, and you know, Dr. Silverman has set up the the challenge really well. Um, we were asked to talk about how do we treat healthy clinical trial participants fairly, um, and I'm going to talk about paying them fairly before turning things over to Dr. Fisher um, to talk a bit more um, about what things look like for a phase one healthy research participant. So, you know, we, we've just heard some of the reasons that a healthy person might enroll in clinical research. There is some empirical data, um, much of which Dr. Fisher has collected herself. Um, but over the course of several decades, right, we, we've talked to healthy people enrolling in various types of research. And, you know, certainly altruism plays a role um, for some communities more than others. Also, you'll hear people say things like, I'm really interested in science, or I was just curious, or bored or, you know, um, sometimes people raise thrill seeking kind of reasons for participating in phase one research. Um, but most of the time, it's money, right? There is a reason why people are enrolling in these studies that they're not going to get direct medical benefit out of participating in. So I thought it would be helpful for us to start with a case. Um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about challenge studies. Challenge studies were something that were really flying under the radar for most people before COVID. Um, but this is a, a, a research design in which healthy people are intentionally exposed to a pathogen um, in order to learn more about that pathogen um, or to learn about the effectiveness of um, various prophylactic interventions or even treatments in ways that would be difficult if you had to wait for people to be naturally exposed to that pathogen in the field. So these um, are commonly used for um, studying the common cold, um, influenza, malaria, basically um, typical for um, naturally self-limiting or easily treatable diseases. We're not worried that we're going to kill people in these studies, and even if they experience some, you know, negative um, sequelae of the, the infection, we're able to mitigate that and treat them really quickly. Now, there has been an emerging ethical debate about whether we should use the challenge study model for emerging infectious diseases that are not naturally self-limiting or necessarily um, treatable. So this came up um, in the context of Zika virus, proposed challenge trials in that context, as well as more famously in the context of um, potential SARS-CoV-2 challenge studies on the argument that this might help speed vaccine development, saving many more lives, um, but also was more controversial because um, higher risk of serious morbidity and mortality with these emerging infectious diseases. 
So um, what you see on the screen here, um, don't worry too much about the details. It's a lot of text, but um, th these are the details of a SARS-CoV-2 challenge study that was done um, in the UK. Um, so this was a study specifically to develop a human challenge model for this pathogen. Um, it was not, you know, to, st to study a vaccine um, or to do any kind of efficacy testing of, of any intervention. It was just to figure out how much of this pathogen does it take to infect people um, and what does the course of the infection look like. So they enrolled 36 healthy participants, ages 18 to 30, who had not previously been infected or vaccinated um, from March to July of 2021. And they they had extensive screening that was intended to minimize the risks that these participants would face. The participants were um, held in a quarantine unit for at a minimum of two weeks. And in addition to be expo being exposed to the virus, um, were subjected to a whole bunch of tests, blood tests, EKGs, um, various assessments and scans and diaries. And then um, after they left quarantine, um, lots of follow-up over the course of a year. So you can see in the flow chart here that lots of people, nearly 27,000 people had registered their interest in participating in this challenge study online. Very atypical, um, but there was um, a big uh, kind of public relations push around this kind of study. Um, so which is just to say lots of people were, were willing to participate. And then, of course, as I mentioned, got down to just 36 volunteers for this um, particular study. Let's see if I can get... Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> we are going to do a poll everywhere. Um, and I hope that this works. So you can see the instructions at the top of the screen there. You can either do this um, on your computer by going to the URL that you see at the top, or you can text my name, Holly F. Lynch, to that number, 22333, and vote. Um, so I'm going to give you a second to do this. And the question that I'm asking you to vote on is just based on those very um, preliminary details that I've provided, would you be willing to approve this study if you sat on the IRB? And maybe um, Leah or Benji, you could just tell me if this is working for you. Um, and then I'll move on to the next slide where it will show us the results. It's certainly working in terms of being able to answer the question. Okay. okay. Great. So I'm going to give it, um, you know, like three more seconds before I move to the next slide. Um, so I don't uh, sway anybody's vote. All right, so um, we have a mix of uh, perspective here. A couple more votes are coming in. Um, so it looks pretty evenly split a third, a third, a third, although changing um, as we go, at least some of you would be willing to approve this study given the safeguards that were in place, the potential social value um, and, and what you understand about the risks and, and benefits of participating in this kind of research. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move to the next um, bit of information that I want you to have about this study, Oops. which is, okay. So um, in this in this particular challenge study, participants, um, this is from the publication, which you can see at the, the citation at the bottom of the slide here. This is the language that they used. Participants were given a donation, okay? Not, not um, a typical language around payment of about 4,500 pounds, which is the equivalent of just over $6,000 to compensate them for the time and inconvenience of taking part in the study. And a little bit of information information about how they went about calculating this using the National Institute for Health Research formula and the UK National Living Wage. Okay, so we have another poll coming up. Okay, so does this information about payment change your perspective about whether you would approve the study? Do you think the payment makes the study ethically stronger, ethically worse, doesn't change the ethics of the study, or maybe you're not sure. So you should be able to vote again. Holly, just to let you know, um, the last slide, the results didn't actually show up. So you- They didn't show for everyone? Oh no, they were showing for me. Shoot, okay, I'll tell you the results if they don't show up for you. Exactly, thank you. 
Okay. Well then if you can't see them, it doesn't matter. If I see them, I won't sway your sway your perspective. Okay. So the results are are coming in. Um, and it looks like about a third of you um, voted that the payment makes the study ethically stronger. Um, but 28% of you think it makes the study ethically worse. And a third of you, 34%, say the payment does not change the ethics of the study. All right. Now one more. Uh, poll here. What do you think about the amount of payment? Do you think it's reasonable, coercive, unduly influential, exploitative, none of the above? And I recognize you can only vote for one of these. Um, so just choose the one that is closest to your perspective um, on that about $6,000 payment that these participants received. Ah, you're going to be an easy crowd. Um, about two thirds of you think that the payment sounds reasonable. 12% um, say coercive, 16% say unduly influential. And uh, a handful, maybe one or two of you are saying none of the above, but nobody um, thought that it was exploitative. Okay, well, I apologize that you couldn't see the results, but you'll have to trust me that that's, that that's where they came out. Um, so I, I use that as an example of, um, a study that was really burdensome to be a part of. And although they really minimized the risk to the participants, um, and ultimately, you know, no participants experienced major, um, you know, any serious harm from participating in the study. We, of course, didn't know that at the outset. So this was um, fairly ethically controversial to have run this study. Um, the payment um, didn't get a lot of attention once it actually happened, um, but there was a lot of discussion about how payment should be set in this kind of project. So, so what I want to articulate to you, um, you know, thinking about that example and others that you may have come across in your own work, is that payment can be critical to study success, right? There's probably not enough altruists to fill the phase one studies um, that need to happen for drug development to succeed. The SARS-CoV-2 challenge study was um, unique, right, in the midst of what we hope will be a once-in-a-lifetime a um, pandemic. So there were lots of people who are willing to kind of contribute to that not necessarily the case for other um, early stage um, human subjects research. But what we know empirically is that healthy participants say payment is necessary for them to be able to participate, right, to cover their costs, to make them willing to participate, um, but it is not sufficient. And um, over and over again, we see data where healthy research participants say, look, I, I wanted to get paid, but I wasn't blind to the risk and I will decide which study to be in based on how risky it was. Um, and we also know that payment is absolutely common in the context of healthy participant research, although we don't have a great set of benchmarks to know how much people are getting paid. There's spotty reporting in the clinical literature um, and no kind of universal database where these payments get entered. Um, we also have empirical data beyond um, healthy participants alone. Um, and so we know that payment can be effective in improving recruitment to trials, which is what you might hypothesize, but it is not always effective. And so maybe we're not paying people enough. Maybe the research is too risky or burdensome in other ways. Um, so it, it's one lever, but it is not the only lever that we need to push to um, make sure that people are enrolling in important research. There have been some empirical analyses of what's called unjust inducement, which is what Benji mentioned before, where we worry about over-enrolling disadvantaged populations in research. And in fact, you may have seen um, a recent stat news story that was um, articulating or covering um, a recent research study in which um, payment, higher levels of payment were successful in mitigating income and race enrollment gaps um, in a study that would have required people to submit blood samples um, to participate. So basically what these researchers found was that at lower payment levels, you were getting um, more high income white participants. And it wasn't until you got to very substantial payment levels that the um, income and race enrollment gaps we're closing. Okay, so in addition to being potentially important as a matter of recruitment, payment is a matter of fairness and respect to research participants, which is what we're hoping to talk more about today. These participants, whether it's in the SARS-CoV-2 challenge study or other phase one research, are contributing a valuable service to science. 
every other entity is getting paid, right? The researchers are getting paid. The research staff is getting paid. The site is getting paid. The company is eventually going to be getting paid, you know, assuming that their product ends up being successful. So why should the participants whose participation is absolutely critical be the only ones who are cut out of it? So being altruistic is, is okay, um, but that should not be the kind of moral expectation um, that we have of research participants. Um, and Benji has already flagged that low payment can be unfair and exploitative. And just so we're all on the same page, when I talk about exploitation, what I mean is taking unfair advantage of people. I just checked my stopwatch and realized that I have uh, didn't press it. So someone's going to have to flag me when I, <laughs> when I, maybe Benji, you could give me like a five minute warning when I'm um, almost at time, if that would be okay. Um, so the, the next point that I want to raise is that even though payment is absolutely critical, it is also ethically fraught in a number of ways that Benji introduced um, at the start. So in order to have valid informed consent to research participation, we want to make sure that people have the capacity to consent, that we're disclosing all material information to them, that they're able to comprehend that information and then make a voluntary decision to participate. So outside some exceptional circumstances, research without valid consent is unethical. Um, now, coercion and undue influence are the things that um, give us some, some worry when it comes to payment. Um, so if payment is coercive or unduly influential, then it would be interfering with valid consent and we would have these significant ethical concerns. But how do we know, right? How do we know if payment is coercive or unduly influential? Well, you might think we could look at the research regulations. Unfortunately, they are not much help at all. So um, I've cut and pasted some text here from the relevant regulation. They do not mention payment at all. Instead, what they say is that in the context of seeking informed consent, investigators should only do so under conditions um, that minimize the possibility of coercion and undue influence, which are not defined in the regulatory text. Now, um, there has been some federal guidance about ethical payment for research participation. The guidance says, you know, payment is common and in general acceptable. Well, that's a good thing because it's happening all the time. They also note that it should be just and fair, um, but they express some concern about excessive um, and inappropriate payment with the potential to compromise voluntary informed consent. And then they go on to warn IRBs to be vigilant about minimizing the possibility for coercion and undue influence. As Benji, you know, highlighted at the beginning, how are IRBs vigilant? Restricting incentives for participation. So what we end up with is this one-sided focus on high payment and not nearly enough concern about the exploitative unfairness of paying people too little for what they are undertaking as research participants. And so that's one of the main messages here is that we have to think about low payment, not only potentially too high payment. Um, now, Benji had also mentioned that IRBs, when they're assessing the risks and benefits of research, um, are not allowed to consider payment as a benefit that offsets risk. In other words, you cannot include a, a really high payment in your research in order to make it approvable. The IRB has to assess whether the research is approvable separate and apart from payment. And that becomes really ethically important in ways that I'll um, describe in just a moment. All right, so the, the feds are starting to acknowledge some nuance. At the very least, they articulate that reimbursement for travel and lodging expenses does not raise any issues regarding undue influence. So that's a step in the right direction, but um, they still articulate that IRBs need to be sensitive to other types of payment. So one really um, maybe a bit pedantic comment that I wanna um, make here is that payment is not coercive. If you understand, coercion to be defined as a threat to violate somebody's rights or a threat not to fulfill an obligation that you have to them in order to get them to comply with something you want them to do. And the other party has no reasonable alternative but to comply. Payment is not a threat, right? A genuine offer of payment to be a research participant is not a threat to violate somebody's rights. It's not a threat to take away something to which they are otherwise entitled. So even if the payment feels like an offer that's too good to refuse, right? Oh, I need to be in this study. I've got no other opportunity to make this much money. It's not a coercive 
threat. So I would like us to put that um, language aside in this discussion. Coercion is possible in research, right? You could imagine a physician saying, I'm not going to treat you unless you participate in my study, but coercion is not stemming from payment in these examples. But payment can be unduly influential. So if we think about the definition of undue influence, that's when we have an excessive offer that leads to um, a distortion in somebody's judgment. It makes them not able to understand risk. It makes them um, skim over um, or bl be blinded to the risk. And then that leads them to make an unreasonable decision to take on a risk of harm or burden that is um, against their self-interest. We need to differentiate between undue influence and mere influence. So lots of times I hear um, people say, well, that person wouldn't have participated in the research if they weren't getting paid that much money. To which I say, would you go to work unless you were getting paid, right? It, you know, we, we can be influenced by money in ways that are not bad or harmful. So a mere influence is just when you have an attractive offer that leads to a reasonable judgment and a reasonable decision. We are not worried about mere influence caused by research payment. Now, I mentioned before the role of IRBs in evaluating the risks and benefits of research and making sure that they are reasonable um, before, um, you know, before payment is allowed to proceed. Benji, I saw that you raised your hand, but I cannot see anybody. So um, I don't know if you want to jump in. Oh, just to say five minutes left. Okay, awesome. I'm going to go faster. <laughs> um, so, so the fact that IRBs are making sure that um, the research is not unreasonable to ask people to participate in is going to play a big role in minimizing the possibility of undue influence. Okay, if you if it's not unreasonable to participate, then we don't need to worry about paying people too much. Now, IRBs are not perfect. They can't account for idiosyncrasies in individual participants. They're reviewing research for populations. There could be you know, some member um, of the target population that's eligible to participate, but there's something special about them that the IRB couldn't possibly have known. So if you think about a study that has a risk um, of, of a permanent tremor, causing a permanent tremor, you know, you're not going to have an exclusion criteria for concert pianists in your protocol, but it might be particularly risky for a concert pianist to participate in that study. Now that person could potentially be unduly influenced to participate. We also cannot eliminate the possibility of deception, right? Payment could cause people um, to lie about their eligibility to participate or lie about um, their, their continued participation. For example, if they're experiencing adverse events that would make them ineligible to continue participating. And that's risky for them. And it also poses a risk to scientific integrity. I'm going to skip over this um, going into too much detail, but we do have some evidence that money induces um, participants to lie about their eligibility. And I was actually part of a research team where we tried to study this more specifically. Um, just to cut to the chase, what we did was we did a survey um, through GFK Knowledge Networks, which was a nationally representative online sample of adults. And the hard thing about um, studying whether people are lying to you is that it's hard to know whether they're telling the truth. So we did a survey where we told people you're eligible to participate based on whether you have or have not had a flu vaccine in the past six months. And then we told them how much we would pay them if they were eligible. So for example, you're eligible if you had a flu vaccine, we'll pay you $5. And then we said, did you have a flu vaccine? So they have a motivation to be untruthful so that they could get the money. And we could compare them to the group that was told they would be eligible if they had not had a flu vaccine. In a random sample, you would expect those numbers, if there was no lying, to match, right? The number of people saying, yes, they've had a flu vaccine in each of these groups should be the same, but that is not what we found. Um, as you can see in the red box here, um, those numbers in the middle, 16, 21, 15%, um, that was the difference between the two groups, right? We, those numbers should be zero if everybody was um, telling the truth. So we were seeing a fair bit of deception in our sample. We also tested to see whether payment amount would cause more lying. Um, and we didn't actually see that. So if higher payments led to more lying, what you'd see on this chart um, would be 
um, results along these red dotted lines. Um, but really, we're seeing a clear deviation from the blue line. That's the lying. But the payment amount didn't really matter too much. So let me skip ahead here. The other challenge I wanted to flag is that IRBs might just fail in general, right? They are um, you know, supposed to be making sure that research risks are reasonable before they're offered to research participants. Um, but we might have conflicts of interest influencing IRBs. They might face gaps in their expertise. And we have to acknowledge that IRBs are largely entities that have to rely on trust. They have to rely on the researchers telling them honestly what they are going to do and then adhering to that. Um, and they typically are doing paper-based review. They're not going to the research site. They're not overseeing the consent process in real time. And so it is totally possible that um, risky and unreasonable research might slip through. Now, this doesn't mean that payment should necessarily be low, right? IRBs don't have to eliminate the possibility of undue influence. They have to minimize the possibility of undue influence, and they need to balance concerns about payments that might be too high against concern about payment that could be too low. So we can acknowledge, right, some idiosyncratic participants might slip through. We might be worried about deception, but before we lower payment to avoid deception, we should think about, you know, objective criteria for enrollment and adverse event reporting, educating potential participants about the risks of deception and improving IRB's abilities to um, weed out unreasonable research. I want to be really, really clear about this. If research is unreasonable, the solution is not, oh, well, pay people less to participate in the unreasonable research. The solution is, no, we have to make sure that the research is reasonable. So that is a concern that extends far beyond payment. Okay, so very briefly, just to kind of um, flag a couple of terms that Benji used at the beginning, reimbursement, compensation, and incentive. If we think about the function that payment is playing, that can also help reduce our concern. Now, reimbursement is payment for out-of-pocket expenses, and I would like to articulate that that is a, um, a matter of fairness. We should not be expecting people to pay out of their own pocket to contribute to good science, right, that we all need people to participate in in order to generate um, scientific knowledge and medical benefit. So that's something that I don't think should be dependent on the budget. I think, you know, you should have to budget to reimburse people's out-of-pocket expenses, and we are not worried about undue influence in this context. Nobody is participating in research just to get their out-of-pocket expenses covered. Compensation, right? So as Benji mentioned, this is a type of payment that is intended to compensate people for the time, effort, and burden that they take on um, as research participants. And this is also a matter of fairness, right? People sh should be fairly compensated for their contributions. All compensation is trying to do is make research as attractive as comparable non-research activities. So there too, we should have lower concern about undue influence. It's not intended to provide a net benefit. It is intended to make participants whole. Incentives is the area where we really might need to um, pay a bit more attention and, and think about undue inducement. Incentives are payments that go beyond what's owed as a matter of fairness, okay? So they are above and beyond reimbursement and compensation. Their purpose is to encourage recruitment and retention by making research participation even more attractive than other things people could do to make money. So undue inducement is possible here. Um, but again, remember what I told you empirically, right? We're not seeing that payment compromises people's ability to recognize risks, um, and again, if we think the research is reasonable to participate in, then we can worry a lot less about incentives. So whereas um, reimbursement and compensation are owed as a matter of fairness, incentives are not necessarily owed, but you might need them in order to get adequate recruitment for your study. So where I will leave things um, before we you know, um, move on to, to um, Jill's talk and, and the discussion is um, to highlight something else that Benji said. Sometimes um, I worry that IRBs, when they express concern about research payment, are really expressing discomfort with the study that has been approved, concern that um, the study is too risky or burdensome, and so we should not be paying people to participate in it. 
But if the study is too risky or burdensome, then we shouldn't be approving it in the first instance. So payment cannot make the study itself unreasonable or reasonable. Those things need to be treated independently. Um, so I will um, I will end there, and maybe during the Q and A we can talk a little bit more about um, fair compensation for research related injury, um, which is uh, a little bit different from other types of payment, but also another way to make sure that we are treating healthy participants fairly. Okay, and I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Thank so, you. Much. Thanks so much, Holly. Over to you, Jill. Great. So. That, that was a great kind of overview of the issues that I want to touch on with my talk. So I, I ended up titling what I'm going to talk about today as um, research payment as financial risk, um, healthy volunteers experiences and phase on trials. So this is kind of turning the typical discussion about research payment on its head in some ways to kind of focus on how actually paying people um, might be a risk that we actually don't disclose to them. So hopefully that will make more sense in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to just um, note here, when I talk about phase one trials, um, I am of course talking about first in human trials. So when it's literally the first time an uh, investigational new drug is given to a, to a research participant. But from the perspective of healthy volunteers, particularly those who tend to enroll um, serially or repeatedly in these kinds of clinical trials, they don't necessarily distinguish between the kind of true phase one trials and other trials that are that need healthy volunteers. So for instance, there are lots of healthy volunteer trials that are um, metabolism studies or drug-drug interaction studies or the kinds of studies that need to get um, bio, uh, that, that, need, that help get generic drugs on the market, so bioequivalent studies. So when I think about phase one trials, I kind of group all of these things together because these are sort of the whole array of studies that healthy volunteers are participating in. So I wanted to just give that as context because I'm gonna talk a little bit about how much healthy volunteers actually earn from clinical trials. Um, so we could kind of situate this as a way to think about um, whether or not there is potentially undue inducement happening or how fair compensation actually is. And this was flagged um, when Holly was talking about challenge trials, but I do wanna just flag it again because it's really, really important. But for the most part, these clinical trials that involve healthy volunteers really are very burdensome compared to a lot of phase two or phase three trials in the sense that often um, healthy volunteers are asked to be confined to a research unit for some or all of the clinical trial. And this could be days or even potentially weeks that they're confined. So for instance, um, over the course of my research on healthy volunteers, um, there were at least a few trials that were 30 or more days that participants literally were locked into a research facility. Um, and so it really does kind of change how we think about what might be fair and how much potentially is owed to healthy volunteers who enroll in these trials. So the going rate um, in the US for phase one trials kind of depends on the region of the country. But um, for the most part, these trials pay about $200 to $250 per night um, that healthy volunteers have to spend in the clinic. And based on um, the research of my re uh, research team, we found that the average clinical trial, phase one trial, pays about $3,000. Um, what's interesting, too, uh, is that a lot of the research clinics um, really do give preference to repeat participants. And this is because um, the clinics can rely on them to know um, what's required of them to actually stick it out through the, the entire study. Um, they tend to be more compliant with what needs to be done during the clinical trial. And so there are a lot of healthy volunteers who want to participate in multiple clinical trials of this sort, but also the research clinics themselves want to have those participants. So I think that's another important dynamic here that needs to be underscored. So oftentimes when I talk about healthy volunteers, you know, I think a lot of people have this vision of healthy volunteers as college students who are enrolling in these trials for extra money. But at least in the US, when we're thinking about phase one trials, um, this isn't actually the typical demographic at all of who participates. So it's mostly men, and this is um, in part because of inclusion exclusion criteria that make it difficult for females of childbearing potential to enroll. And I'm happy to talk more about that during the Q&A if people are interested. 
Um, but really importantly, there's a disproportionate number of minority participants who enroll in these clinical trials. So um, on the East Coast and the Midwest, it tends to be mostly Black participants. Um, and on the West Coast, it tends to be um, lots of Latino participants. And most participants are between the ages of 20 and 45. And in fact, the majority are in their 30s and early 40s. So actually, it's not so much the younger participants who are enrolling in these trials. And as I've already noted, these trials require people to um, consent to an inpatient confinement. So it starts to make sense, like who, you know, what their social situation might be. And so most of them are unemployed um, or at least have had a, an unstable employment history. Um, as a result, mostly they're lower income and often they have low educational attainment. In addition, many have a history of incarceration. In the US, there's uh, quite a bit of discrimination against people who have a, a criminal record. And so these clinical trials are potentially a good opportunity for people because there's um, the people who have a criminal record are not barred from participating in clinical trials. And likewise, um, many participants are immigrants to the US, some of whom are not legally permitted to work. And so again, like without um, ha without that sort of impediment to earning an income, it, it does make clinical trials an attractive option for many of these individuals. And in this context, when we're kind of talking about diversity and how do we improve diversity in clinical trials, it's really interesting to look at phase one healthy volunteer trials because you know, at least from my perspective, this higher percentage of racial and ethnic minorities in these trials really doesn't feel like a recruitment success. And so this is kind of a question that has motivated my work of really teasing out, well, why doesn't it feel like a recruitment success? And so I published a book in 2020 that really explores phase one trials. Um, and I really kind of grapple with this paradox of minorities participating in the riskiest studies that have no direct benefit. And so it, over the course of the book, the primary argument, especially that's important for today's conversation, is that it's really the racial and economic inequalities in the US that create a market of healthy volunteers for phase one trials. So essentially, because we have um, so much social inequality in the US, it really does sort of create the context for why this, these groups of people would be particularly willing to enroll in phase one trials. The book also looks at validity concerns and um, how we have to be um, also aware of how phase one trials tend to make uh, new drugs appear safer than they are. But that's sort of a different conversation than what we're having today. So just to give you a sense of how people talk about their financial motivations, um, Lewis told me, I wanted to make some money. It's definitely not because I want to save the world. Let's get that on the record right now. No, I don't want to save the world. I need to make money. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of times participants might reference altruism and Holly flagged this as one potential reason why healthy volunteers might enroll in trials. And I think from the perspective of a lot of the participants that I've spoken to um, over the course of doing this research, they um, acknowledge the social benefit and I think they appreciate the fact that they could be contributing to science or the development of new medications, but that's not their motivation for enrolling. Um, and a lot of participants, especially when they're thinking about their very first trial and why they enrolled in that first one, they do kind of flag that they were in a situation of financial desperation. So for instance, um, Manny, and these are all in quotes because they're pseudonyms, by the way, um, said, you know, where else am I going to get this income? My car broke down, you know, what are we going to do? If I don't pay my parole, I'm going to go back to prison. That's pretty much how I see it as income. That's for real. And anything else is maybe helping you out, you know, seeing what the medicine does too. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely these situations where participants find themselves in where they do need um, some income and they typically need it relatively quickly. And so there's this offer of the compensation that participants can get from a phase one trial that's a lump sum um, that is incredibly attractive for a lot of these participants. And as far as why they might keep in, enrolling in clinical trials. I think Wesley um, demonstrates or gives an example, kind of explains this really well. So he says, you know, I think I'll keep doing them until I get old, like I can't do no more. I mean, I'm always going to do studies, you know, because I, because I know I can always count on the cash, because sometimes you can get a big chunk of money and you can get out of your debt for a little bit of time, you know, 
but you're going to always be in debt, you know, unless you hit the lottery, because the bills keep coming back as fast as you pay them, they come back. And so this sense that um, in some ways, without a robust social, social safety net um, from the government or states, um, that clinical trials sort of provide a, a type of social safety net that participants can rely on, that they know that if they can just qualify for these trials, that it is a source of income when they need it. Of course, a lot of participants um, also are these kind of professionals um, that want to do studies exclusively. And so I wanted to give you an example of one of the participants who was in this position. Um, so he said, this is Bennett, he said, probably the biggest personal gain I've ever had is that the money comes in a large lump sum. I've made more in a month than most people make in half a year. Longest study I ever did was like 36 days. It was like $7,300. Never have I had that much money in my possession at one time. It's not a lot of money, but it's enough to really do something, you know, it's enough to have somewhat of a free life. I don't consider this a career, meaning clinical trials, um, but at the same time, busting my hump at McDonald's for eight or nine dollars an hour and bringing home nine hundred to a thousand dollars in a month when I can make that in a week just doesn't seem feasible to me, you know. Like doing the lab rat thing, I've grown accustomed to a certain kind of lifestyle, having lump sums of money whenever I need it, you know, and being able to do whatever I want. But then he, he kind of transitions to talk about how it's not necessarily as good as it seems. So he said, the thing that the lab rat thing lacks is consistency, you know? If my rent is due and I get into a study and the study gets canceled, my rent gets canceled. If something happens like my muscle enzymes are up or something's off and I don't get into the study, I'm screwed. It has its pros and it has its cons. And that's probably the biggest con for me. It's just that, you know, it's not guaranteed. Not only are you competing with yourself, your own body, you're competing with other people, you know. And so this was very, a very common thing, theme among participants that um, it, it was definitely not a certain thing. It was nice to know that there were studies out there that, that, out there that they could screen for, but it was very difficult to um, feel like it was income that they could absolutely guarantee or count on. So, um, my research team was really interested in just kind of looking at how much do these clinical trials pay? And so in a longitudinal study of healthy volunteers, we asked them to report to us about the clinical trials they were screening for and participating in over the course of three years. And over that three year period, um, we got about a thousand um, clinical trials from this database of um, 131 participants who were reporting their clinical trial screening. And so we were able to kind of look at not only how much were they earning, which I'll show you in a moment, but also what sort of the range of how much these studies pay. Um, and I already mentioned that the average um, compensation is about $3,000, but you could just see here um, that the vast majority of studies uh, pay less than $4,000, um, and very few are paying in these really high range of um, over 6,000 or certainly over 10,000. As far as how much participants can actually earn in um, uh, over the course of trying to do clinical trials, what we found was that um, in general, participants tended to screen for about three clinical trials each year. They participated in one or two, and they earned roughly $4,000 annually. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of times when we look at these amounts of how much clinical trials pay, it actually does sort of ignite the imagination of, wow, you know, like these studies really uh, pay a lot. Potentially participants can really earn a ton of money. But on the ground, um, participants really weren't earning as much as, um, as it might have seemed. And in fact, in some cases, participants were even surprised that they weren't earning as much money because um, in our study, we were reporting back to them each year of what they had given to us in data to say like, oh, look, you know, you screen for this number of studies, you earned this much money. And some of the participants were um, really surprised that they hadn't earned as much as they thought they did, um, which was kind of an interesting dynamic. Even the participants um, who, you would kind of think of as these professional participants, um, they too didn't, it, you know, this inconsistency in payment really came through that there was a lot of volatility in how much they earned from year to year. So, <clears throat> so for instance, in one year, our, our top earning participant uh, did earn almost $40,000, which is 
pretty incredible. He had to participate in um, eight clinical trials that year, um, but in the in another year, he had, he'd earned less than twenty thousand dollars. So again, I think it really also shows that some participants are putting in a huge amount of effort to enroll in these studies, um, but it's not guaranteed and they really, in a sense, have to put in a lot of effort if they're really trying to earn a lot of income from, from, from trials in this way. And participants do oftentimes feel like, although they're motivated by the money and they are doing it for the money, that they do feel exploited in some ways. And they do feel like um, the industry itself is, is earning a lot of money off of their participation and they're not necessarily sharing in that fairly. Um, so for instance, I think this quote kind of gets at that. Um, Shirley told me the drug companies, the academic institutions or whatever it is, uh, this huge wheel that turns, you know, to power clinical studies. Yeah, it's just so flippant capitalistic, you know, when you think about it. Everybody lowering their prices they pay to participants. The sponsors are just cheering themselves, you know, because they're actually making more profit off of people, meaning healthy volunteers, who are ignorant and desperate, I would say. Um, another participant was com commenting on the huge amount of variability in clinic conditions with noting that some um, of these research clinics are really quite nice and comfortable, whereas others are not. Um, so he said, different clinics are different. I understand you have like the major pharmaceutical companies and you have the middlemen actually test the drugs for them. It's kind of getting a little crazy now because like these different places, it's like, you know, it's like a manufacturing plant now and how they treat healthy volunteers, processing them in and processing them out. I mean, it's getting a little out of hand and there needs to be more regulation in this industry. All the veterans, and that's how he kept referring to the healthy volunteers who'd been doing it for a long time. Um, have said, that's it, they need to regulate this, it's getting out of hand now. So really interesting to think about healthy volunteers actually advocating for more regulation around um, clinical trial participation. But I want to pivot now um, to talking about compensation in a really different way. Um, and this is based on a paper that I have coming out with my colleagues, um, Maggie Waltz and Arlene Davis, this um, due to come out in, in the summer of this year that looks at taxes and compensation as tax income and sort of the financial and legal risks that come along with um, phase one trial participation in particular because um, of the higher amounts of compensation associated with these studies. So for tax purposes, healthy volunteers are independent contractors. Um, and I think now, especially with the gig economy, we could really see a lot of parallels between how healthy volunteers are paid in clinical trials with how potentially Uber drivers are paid. And so there's definitely um, important tax implications because from the IRS perspective, participants are self-employed and so they need to pay self-employment tax, which is oftentimes higher than if you um, were employed through uh, an employer per se. And as part of what we did in this study or in this paper, we looked at what do informed consent forms typically say about tax liability and um, there's very little, uh, essentially. Our paper does give a, a few examples, but there's there's not that much information about the fact that healthy volunteers are, gonna, are going to have to pay taxes. And what typically is in there when it's in there is it's um, very opaque language that I think is potentially either confusing or it's something for that would be really easy for participants not to pay much attention to. And so for this topic, we ended up really looking at the interviews that we had conducted with healthy volunteers to see, you know, how did taxes come up over the course of talking about compensation and, you know, what were the different things that um, they flagged as important. So one of the things that was very striking and actually what motivated us writing this paper to begin with was that a lot of participants just believed that it was tax-free money, like that they claimed that a lot. Um, and that that was one of the nice things from their perspective of participating, that they wouldn't have to pay taxes, that no taxes were being taken out of this um, check that they might get. However, for many participants, that led to the shock of getting the 1099 at the beginning of the next year. So, you know, if you don't expect that you're going to be paying taxes on it and all of a sudden you're getting a notice that your income from such and such research clinic has been reported to the IRS, um, that was really distressing to, a, to many of the participants that we interviewed. 
interestingly too, some of the participants who did do clinical trials full time talked about how it was really important to educate yourself to navigate the tax system and to really see yourself as an entrepreneur. So as somebody that needs to um, keep your receipts, so have all your expenses so that you could have tax deductions and stuff when you file your taxes. But another really important theme that came out of looking at um, our interviews with healthy volunteers was just how a lot of participants ended up avoiding reporting their trial income at all, in some cases not filing taxes. Um, and so the participants were aware that doing this was actually a, 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 a huge risk to them, um, but it was also something that sometimes they felt that they, they had to do. So for instance, um, Roman said, um, every time that you take that money, it's technically right at that moment tax-free. If you ride under the radar, which I did this in the beginning of my study career, doing studies, I did just enough, whereas I didn't have to pay taxes because I was scared to pay money because I didn't know how I was going to pay it. So I was like, wow, if they tax me off this tax-free money, so to speak, I may owe them a lot of money. That's when the similarity of the drug trade and this trade go hand in hand, because at that point, you're doing something semi-illegal. You're, you're not trying to pay your taxes. The drug dealer, he's out there trying to avoid the police. He's trying to stay a, a step ahead of them. I'm trying to stay a step ahead of the IRS. And you know, there definitely is um, a, a huge burden of tax debt for some of these participants. Um, so for instance, um, in our interview with Steve, he was talking about how he hadn't paid taxes um, in very, very many years. I think he hadn't filed his taxes in 20 years. Um, and one of the reasons he was suddenly motivated to file taxes and to try to get everything up to date with the IRS was because he was applying for a fiance visa um, for his partner with whom he had a child. Um, and he wanted to be able to bring her to the US and bring his child to the US. And essentially, it was one of the conditions of getting this a fiance visa that he had to um, have his tax, he had to be up to date with the IRS. And so anyway, he told us, I probably will owe $35,000, meaning once he had it all settled with the IRS. And most of that is because what the IRS sees on all those years is me doing clinical trials where they didn't take any taxes out. You know, I just got paid in checks without any taxes withheld. So I'm supposed to pay taxes to the IRS all those years for all those clinical trials. Um, another participant um, talked about he how he too was um, struggling to pay about a twelve a twelve thousand dollar tax bill with the IRS and was negotiating how to have um, a payment uh, a payment system in order to uh, get on track to to pay off this debt. So you know when we're thinking about this tax liability, it's it there is potentially a huge burden on participants, particularly when it's not necessarily easy for them to um, save that money and be able to, you know, hold on to it for tax season. Um, and in fact, you know, I think one of the other things that was really striking about talking to participants too was even just finding out that, um, thanks Benji, fi finding out that they, uh, many of them didn't even have bank accounts. So a lot of them were unbanked. So if you're unbanked, how do you really set aside this money for tax purposes? So what we saw was that participants were really, that in some ways that the, the clinical trials created sort of perverse incentives that were coming, that were stemming from tax liability. So in some instances, we saw that participants were trying to stay below income thresholds. So they actually didn't want to participate in, in, in more studies because they were trying to save themselves from, from getting a tax bill potentially. But in, in most cases, we actually saw that um, participants were enrolling new clinic in enrolling in new clinical trials to pay last year's taxes. Um, so, for instance, Lee told us, you know, some people that have put in years doing studies, and the first things those pharmaceutical companies might say is, "Well, look at the money you've made over the years," but it's not tax free. That's why we got to do another study so we can pay taxes. And of course, you know, some of these participants are going to participate no matter what. It's not just that they have a tax bill coming due. But um, the fact of the matter is they do see clinical trials as one of the ways to actually be able to, to pay what they owe to the IRS. Um, and so, you know, this is what 
starts to really worry me that it's another way that potentially we're taking advantage of healthy volunteers and it's sort of an invisible way that we might be taking advantage of them because essentially what what starts to happen is that the compensation for participants is less than it may seem so when they're offered a certain amount to enroll in the clinical trial it seems like that's really what we're we're guaranteeing them that what we're offering them but in fact it's something less than that and it's something less that's often hard to calculate because it's hard to know what an individual's tax um, liability is going to be or what they're going to owe on taxes for a specific trial so for instance, Travis said, after, you know, minus the taxes, the time, the travel, the this, the that, you know, how many screenings you have to go to and all, you know, just at the end of the day, it just, you know, it was a lot less than what you, thought you actually thought you were making. And another issue that kind of came up too was participants worry that they could actually be harmed in some way by the trial and then still have to pay taxes on it. So Sylvester said, I don't think we should have to pay taxes on this money because you shouldn't have to pay taxes for a thing like this because we're doing nothing but service to the people and nothing bad comes out of this. It's 100% all good. Only bad that's coming out of it is if something happens to you in a study to you, your own person, and then you have to deal with that. Then you didn't get much from it, but that one check and then you still have to pay taxes on it. And so, you know, I think that this idea about whether or not um, research participation should be taxed is definitely something we need to talk about more. And in fact, Leah Rand and Aaron Kesselheim recently published an article in clinical trials um, called Payments for Research Participation, um, Don't Tax the Guinea Pig. I love that title. Um, so I think, you know, this is definitely something we need to think more about. Um, and it's, I think, another really critical aspect of thinking about fairness here. So I'll end by just saying, you know, that we have this system of phase one trials that's a, a core part of the drug development process. So the regulatory system requires phase one trials, and those clinical trials are typically healthy volunteer trials. And then we have um, healthy volunteers who are incentivized by the financial compensation, um, but that they have to have the time and ability to be confined for long periods to enroll in these studies. And that the US context of social and economic inequalities funnels people of color into these trials because they often don't have better options to earn income. And you know, there's just this kind of ethical issue from my perspective that emerges from this um, promise of financial freedom that these high amounts of compensation seem to offer. But participants, you know, it's very rare that participants see that or report that the trial compensation really was transformative in their lives. It's usually it is just something that helps make, make ends meet and then something that they may have to do again when they need that money again. And then as I've been saying over the last few minutes, you know, the compensation may appear substantial, but um, not only doesn't it provide financial security, but it even comes with financial and legal risk from taxes. So I will end here and I look forward to the questions and our discussion. Great, thanks so much. Jill and Holly, wonderful presentations. And um, we do have some questions coming in. So I'll just uh, jump right in to use our time. So um, one of the questions that I think is really interesting that came in uh, early on, uh, I think during Holly's talk, and it was on my list to kind of ask about as well as to, um, to, to ask for you to comment on essentially how this applies to international studies. Um, and when we think about fair payment, we think about paying people equally, but what about when you go to situations where, you know, the the uh, expected wage or the annual wage is much different than uh, what we might expect? And, and how do we um, how do we think about those issues in this context? Well, I, I can say a few words about that to, to start. Um, you know, this is an example where you don't necessarily have to pay people at different sites the exact same amount, right? You want to apply the same principles to determine what you should be paying them. Um, but, you know, a dollar in one place is going to mean something different, you know, in, a, in another part of the world. So, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind um, might be what is the, um, you know, the minimum wage in that area? Is it a living wage? We should not peg research payments to 
exploitative minimum wages. Now, the challenge then becomes if you pay the equivalent of a living minimum wage, or um, you know, it, it may not be minimum wage. That's a, that's a that's another. Well, I'll I'll leave that aside. I'll come back to that in a second. But um, if you pay more than the minimum wage in a given area, then research becomes more attractive than the other alternative options that people have to make money then you're no longer in the compensation zone, you're in the incentive zone. And so the concerns about undue inducement tick higher. Um, but the, the, um, the need to pay fairly then kind of weighs against this concern about undue influence. So my, my um, personal perspective is that you ought to target the living minimum wage, right? And then pay related to that, wherever the geographic, wherever, um, you know, in the world, the research is being done. And then you come into challenging questions about um, if you have people in confinement for 30 days, are you going to pay them 24 hours a day? Um, or are you going to pay them only when they're actively engaged in research activities? Well, if they're confined, they may not be able to make other income, right? So that suggests you ought to pay them for the entirety of the time that they're there. So um, I don't mean to suggest that there is a single formula um, for, for how to go about doing this, but we, we ought to think about comparable non-research activities and target payment accordingly. Um, and it doesn't have to be the exact same at every location um, where a study is being done. Thanks so much, Holly. Joe, anything to add? Yeah, so I've primarily studied the US or only studied the US. So I don't I don't have any kind of empirical, empirical examples from the international research, but I think even in the US, this can be a bit of an issue that um, participants, especially those who might go from clinic to clinic or participate sort of in a range of areas that, you know, they note that there are payment differences across these geographic areas. And so in some ways that can incentivize them to travel. Um, that at least in the US, Texas has a reputation for paying more than in other parts of the US. And so, you know, I think there probably should be a, a more effort to try to have some kind of standards for how much um, clinical trials are offering so that it's not, I mean, and I guess, you know, this is part of the vicissitudes of IRBs of, you know, that one IRB might approve one amount or, or research clinics or sponsors are motivated to um, offer less amounts that it does create these differences in how much different trials offer. And I think that does create different kinds of problems and, and, and including for fairness, not only um, for individual participants, but um, kind of just thinking about this whole system as in kind of in general. Well, there was I, I just underscore really quickly. I mean, that that point about fairness that we that we're focused on here is so critical because you can easily see a, a race to the bottom where you say, oh, our competitive site, they're only paying people this much. So we just have to pay slightly more than that in order to encourage people to you know, enroll here. Thinking about it in that market-based way, rather than thinking about what is the value of what this person is contributing to science? What is the burden that they're taking on? Um, we didn't talk about payment for risk. Um, so I, I've argued that we ought to pay people for time and burden um, up front, because those are things that you take on no matter what. The risk, right, is a potential harm. So I think it's acceptable to say, we're not going to pay you for the risk. We're going to pay if the harm occurs, right? So this came up in some of your comments, Jill, right? That, you know, look, we, we have to get taxed even if we get hurt. We have an abysmal approach to paying people for research-related injuries and, and not just you know paying for their care, but making sure that they um, have the equivalent of something like workers' comp, right? Covering their other costs that um, if they're unable to work um, or God forbid they die, right? That we have some mechanism um, to financially compensate for that. Um, it's not something that's required by law, despite basically every commission that has ever looked at this saying it is something that ought to be required. It's just something that's left site by site um, for, um, for studies to decide how they're going to handle this, which is a huge problem. I think that's a great point and something that we end up, you know, in IRB world, essentially arguing with sponsors on the wording, uh, you know, on, an, on a daily basis of exactly what 
some of that coverage looks like. I don't know, Holly, if you want to comment on, because you know more about it than I do, the the difference in Europe around um, the subject insurance and potential payment for injury and things. Yeah, I mean, so I, I don't have specific knowledge um, in, in other jurisdictions other than to say, you know, there are, for example, India is, is one that kind of stands out as um, having a legal requirement to cover research related injuries. It can be um, much different in countries where they have a national health care system. Um, it's particularly bad in the U.S. because we don't have um, a system where everybody is insured and able to get care regardless of how they are harmed. Um, um, but yes, this is something that the U.S. is very far behind um, in making sure that we're caring for participants appropriately. Yeah, I'm not an expert either, but I think there are some European countries that essentially require the sponsor to get insurance, essentially, to cover uh, to cover subject injury. Um, one of the questions that came up is, is, based on the conversation we just had, is there any evidence of sponsors or CROs, et cetera, essentially moving research to places where the living wage is less essentially to, to, to you know, take advantage of that. Um, I don't know if we know that. I don't know for sure whether or not that happens, but I mean, I do think that, I think that there's sort of, um, you could kind of see the sponsors are sort of stratified, like the, the, the largest sponsors tend to um, go to the most legitimate CROs or um, sort of the best clinics, whereas some of the smaller, maybe startup kinds of pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies um, that are essentially developing a product that maybe they hope will get um, licensed to a large company, they just don't have the budget. So I don't know necessarily that they're trying to in intentionally go to these places that are undercutting the participants necessarily. But I mean, I think that that is part of this market that there are sort of the, the budget CROs or the budget um, phase one units that, that exist um, and that they charge less for running the studies, but they also, it, it does sort of create an opportunity to pay participants left, less too. Yeah, I mean, it's an issue across um, across the drug development spectrum, right? So looking beyond, beyond phase one, um, there's a lot of reasons why companies take their studies abroad. Um, financial reasons are one, right? It can be a lot cheaper to do research elsewhere. Um, you may have people more willing to participate in order to gain access to the care um, and attention that they'll receive in a study that they might not otherwise have access to. Um, and then there, you may also have people in the U.S. who are unwilling to participate in the research Either, you know, for example, maybe the drug already got approval here, um, but there are further studies required um, to know whether it works. And so we sometimes have to go elsewhere um, where the standard of care is different in order to do those studies. Um, so that's a much broader issue about um, exploitation um, of, of global um, global populations, although I will say that's something that FDA has been talking about more, more, and, more and more recently um, about when they will accept data that was con for trials conducted elsewhere and when they want to see domestic um, participants. Thank you. There's a bunch of questions that are all kind of interrelated to the tax questions. I did put in, um, uh, Joe, you referenced uh, Dr. Randon Kesselheim's recent paper. I put that in the answers in the Q&A because I think it's a great paper as well and a great title. And Good for people to see that. I uh, certainly agree with the message they share. But some of the questions that are here are um, about essentially is there a way for people to, you know, use hospital web portals to get their tax documents in one place? Can research assistants uh, discuss the tax issues and help them get bank accounts? Um, what's the easiest way to make sure that income? Well, is there a way to essentially get uh, any tax credits or, or exemptions? I don't. I don't know if you want to. Joe, if you want to talk any more about any of those kind of topics on the tax, there's just a lot of questions there. Yeah, so I mean, I think I think researchers can do a lot more to inform participants about the tax liability. I think um, so. In the, our forthcoming paper, we do have some um, sample language that potentially could go into consent forms to try to cover this better. But I do think that it really needs to be flagged for participants that they will owe taxes on it. And I think. In general, a lot of times the research teams don't 
love to talk about um, the compensation because I think, especially with healthy volunteers, there's this sense like, well, they're so focused on the money. Like that's not what we need to spend time talking to them about. We need to really talk to them about the risks of the study. And I, you know, I really appreciate that um, the research teams have that perspective, but I think in this case too, there is this financial risk that really does need to be flagged as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that it would be pretty difficult for research teams to also help participants with their taxes, but at least for participants to know that they are going to owe money on it is really important. Um, I don't know so much about how to actually change the, the tax system. I don't know if Holly, if you have thoughts about that, I mean, I think it would really require a, a, a bigger um, regulatory shift probably it would take an act of Congress too, I'm not sure. Um, so it's not something that would be particularly easy to change, but I do feel like there is a need for that um, kind of exemption for, for this kind of income. Yeah, I mean, definitely would require legislative change. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think Leah and Aaron's paper is really, um, people on, on this meeting should read it because it, it offers a couple of different examples and suggestions, but um, for, for one, analogous circumstance, we could think about um, live organ donation. And there are all of these incentives to encourage people um, to be live organ donors, um, you know, including like time off from work and, uh, you know, covered time, it, th these kinds of incentives. Now you can't pay for the organ, right? Um, and you can't incent, you know, offer incentive payments for people to do that. And the reason you can't is illegal, it is against the law to do that. So they are different models, despite, um, you know, as some of Jill's participants articulated, both of them are using the body. Um, and, and in fact, you know, the live organ donors are helping one person, right, where the research participants, um, ideally, their contribution is going to be multiplied, you know, over the, you know, over the um, course of scientific development. So there is, I think, an ethical reason to suggest that we would appropriately incentivize people more to participate in research, including by um, reducing their, their tax burden. But at the very least, we should make the tax burden clear to people. Um, and so many people, like I'm not at all surprised. I, they're awesome results, Jill. I'm like, I'm so glad that you have that empirically demonstrated, but I don't find it surprising. So many people, right? They just, they look at their paycheck and their pay stub and say, oh, this is all I owe. And if they didn't take it, I must not have owed it, <laughs> right? People get surprised by their tax liability all the time. Um, so of course it's going to happen in research, especially when we use this um, completely uh, dodgy language about um, the, that they received a donation, right? These challenge study participants received a donation um, or they were reimbursed or they were compensated. No, they were paid. They were workers. In my opinion, I've got a whole paper about <laughs> research participants as workers, right? They're workers. But we we do all this song and dance that they're, no, 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 they're not workers. They're volunteers and all of this stuff. No, they are providing a service. They expect to be paid. Um, and so we have to help them understand that this is a regular paycheck. Um, that will be taxed accordingly. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think, it, you know, anytime you deal with lump sum payments, people end up getting in trouble with not realizing, you know, getting, not realizing they're going to have to pay at some point and so out, outside of the research context. I will yeah, say- Yeah, I mean, so one, one thing you could do, right, is pay people more, like to, to meet their expectation. You were participating in this yeah. study, you thought this was how much you were going to, to get. We don't know exactly what your tax circumstances were, but we are topping it off, you know, with this average amount. Something like that could be potentially beneficial. Official. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, and, and you know, we do uh, require our researchers to talk to people about this. You know, I think it's challenging, though, because, you know, it's, uh, it's often a brief conversation in the context of a, a very long consent process and form and, and, um, and the researchers themselves are often not familiar with the tax implications. And so first, you have to educate the people even, you know, doing the, the teaching about this to the subjects. Um, and, and I think the important thing is, you know, we, we certainly include language and consent forms, but um, it's actually important to tell people at the very beginning of the screening process, basically, so you don't waste their time, you know, uh, by the time they get to the consent process or some other later process. And then, of course, we also, um, it's very hard to track multiple enrollment across various studies, right? People, a researcher knows 
a subject and whether they enrolled in multiple studies in their lab, but not necessarily elsewhere. So really hard. Um, one of the questions that I think, Holly, you just kind of brought to my mind, and I think came up in the, the, the questions and also I kind of was on my mind is, you know, I've thought a lot about, um, you know, the cost of living has gone up, obviously, recently, inflation, other things, um, but our clinical trial budgets have not necessarily uh, gone up to reflect that. Our payments to research participants have not necessarily gone up to reflect that, right? We have some standard uh, standard amounts that we think about that probably haven't been updated in, you know, a decade or more and, and clearly uh, not keeping up with, with 2023. Um, and, and the question that you raised, Holly, that made me think about it was this, you know, maybe you need to pay people more to compensate for the for the tax burden, but um, just paying people more in general. And, and what do you do? You know, the question here on the chat is, you know, what do you do when it gets to the time of the IRB and they feel that somebody needs to get paid more? And, you know, essentially, how do you, how do you, how do you say people need to get paid more if it's not necessarily in the budgets? Um, and, you know, I can certainly answer as to what we do from an IRB perspective, but I'm curious to hear, Holly and Jill, kind of your take on that and, you know, how well, I mean, it seems to me if IRBs feel really comfortable saying a payment amount is too too much and wanting to lower it, that they should also feel very empowered to say, you're not paying a sufficient amount. This is an unfair amount that you want to offer to participants. This is potentially exploitative. So, I mean, I think this feeling that um, they're confined to, to budgets is, is not is not necessarily a fair perspective on it. Um, I think that you know there has to be a move to try to increase the compensation somehow, and it it does seem like IRBs have a lot of power here to start helping shifting this to um, become a, a fairer a fairer wage or a fairer amount of compensation. I totally agree with that, Jill. I mean, I. <laughs> I will disclose that I get really frustrated when people say we don't have the budget to pay our research participants because you should have budgeted for it. Um, and the IRB would not accept a research protocol that um, had, you know, too few research coordinators or um, had, you know, too, too little monitoring for safety. And, the, if, you know, if the researcher said, well, we didn't have the budget for it, he would say, well, I'm sorry, you can't do your study. This is a core component of what it means to do good research, to treat the participants fairly, you have to put it in your budgets. So I don't mean to lay it all at the IRB's feet. Um, I think it's a really multimodal problem because you have investigators who say, well, I'd love to pay more, but the IRB won't allow it. And then you have IRBs that say, well, we wish we could tell people to pay more, but they say they don't have the budget for it. And then the researchers say, well, we you know, had to slash our budget because NIH would only give us this amount of money. Um, which, you know, All of those things are true, right? Um, I, I don't mean to suggest anyone's being <laughs> duplicitous, so maybe it starts with the funders, right? Um, and, and the you know both the federal funders and the the industry funders saying we are going to make this an expectation of ethically acceptable research, and we're going to pay for it. Yeah, I agree one hundred percent, and and would say that there's absolutely times with my IRB hat on that we've said you need to pay people more, or you need to pay for this visit, and. Um, and you do push back basically in the same way that we, as, as Joe, as you mentioned, would say, well, that's too much, you know, that, that it can go in both directions. But I think as, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning and as Holly, I think you talked about, I think IRBs, there's some discomfort, you know, that I, I do think there's this, there's this, there's the, because of the, his, I think because of the long history of being so scared of, you know, overpaying people, I think that there's a lot of discomfort uh, around this. And, and I'm so glad that we're having conversation like this to try to try, try to address that head on to say, you know, actually, um, we probably need to be paying people more in, in, in most circumstances, more so than we need to be concerned about uh, paying them too much. Um, so I know we're at time, I think, essentially, I don't know, um, Dr. Kesselheim and Dr. Rand, if you have anything else to say to wrap up. Uh, no, I just, I want to thank the three of you again for your time and conversation, a plug for the paper, which was really motivated by all of your excellent work, um, bringing forward the challenges around payment that exist and, and what it means to treat people fairly. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. As a reminder, we'll be back again next month um, to talk about climate change and health. So thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you all very much. It's a really great conversation.
Thanks for having us and great questions, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.